Good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to see you all here today. My name is Paul Nurse. I'm president of um, this university, Rockefeller University, and I want to warmly welcome you to our Fall Parents and Science Breakfast Forum. This is the first of three lectures that we've uh, specially designed for parents this year. Now, this Parents and Science Lecture Series is a resource for New, City, New York City parents who are interested in gaining new insight into child and adolescent development. What we're hoping to do is to offer a forum where you can learn about great science, participate in a, a dialogue, and share your perspectives all about raising children. I particularly want to thank the trustees of the Lubin Family Foundation, some of whom are here this morning, um, for generously underwriting this second year of this initiative. It's really greatly appreciated. I also want to extend a, a special welcome for those of you who are visiting the university for the first time, and I hope that today's program will acquaint you with this rather extraordinary institution, founded in 1901 as the first biomedical research um, institute in the United States. Now, since then, Rockefeller has made remarkable contributions to biomedicine recognized the world over. Perhaps on your way into the auditorium, you noticed our new Nobel Prize and Lasker Award wall. It was on your right as you came in. It'll be on your left as you go out. <laughs> now, there's 23 scientists associated with Rockefeller, and we're only a small institution, who have received the Nobel Prize. This is quite an extraordinary track record of success. I want to put that number in perspective for you. If Rockefeller University were a country, it would be ranked in fourth in Nobel Prizes in medicine in chemistry in the world, behind the United States, Britain, and Germany, and actually ahead of France, which would be fifth. <laughs> so, also remarkably, Four of Rockefeller's 23 Nobel laureates received their prizes in the past nine years, so it's very current. But there are other metrics of excellence. I'll just mention a couple. Um, over 20 Rockefeller scientists have received the Albert Lasker Award. This is the American Nobel, often known as that um, for medicine. Um, it's frequently a predictor of a future Nobel Prize. And well over half of our tenured faculty are members of the National Academy of Sciences. Do refer to your program books if you wish to know more about this um, quite remarkable university. Now, today's program, we have with us several leaders in the effort to advance scientific knowledge about autism spectrum disorders, and also several supporters and funders of this crucial work. I want to particularly recognize the Simons Foundation for its um, commitment to autism research. It supports research here at Rockefeller and many other institutions. And Marilyn Simons is with us today. Great pleasure to have her here and thank her for her support. In today's program, um, which is the Autism Enigma, we're really very pleased that Dr. Catherine Lord is with us um, as um, our guest speaker. After her presentation, we'll hear a brief um, overview of basic autism research from neuroscientist Jerry Fishback, who is a visiting professor here at Rockefeller, and we're very pleased to have him here on our faculty. He also serves as a scientific director of the Simons Foundation's uh, Autism Research Initiative. Following Jerry uh, Fishback, um, he, uh, his remarks, he, Jerry will moderate a, a panel discussion with Dr. Lord and with Rockefeller scientist Nat Heintz, our James and Marilyn Simons professor, and 2000 Nobel laureate Paul Greengard, our Vincent Astor professor. Doctors Heinz and Greengard uh, work together on an autism research project here at the university funded by the Simons Foundation. And after the panel discussion, I will then moderate um, questions and answers from the audience. So it's a busy program. I hope you're hanging on to your seats. Um, it's my pleasure to start it by introducing Dr. Catherine Lord, who directs the University of Michigan's Autism and Communication Disorders Center. We're really honored to have her here today. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Lord to the podium. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. 
Thank you very much for inviting me here. And my goals today are threefold. One is to provide a very general introduction to autism spectrum disorders, or ASDs. Um, some of you I know more, far more than I will ever know about ASDs, but some of you don't. So I'm going to start very simply. Second of all is to introduce to you the science of, of how we try to understand the behaviors that characterize ASDs. And then my particular interest, which is trajectories in development. That is how children and adults change over time. Um, and last, I'm going to briefly touch upon empirical findings about educational and behavioral interventions with the idea of leading us into the questions of what is ASD and how does it respond to different behavioral treatments and how then might neurobiology help us figure out what causes this and what we can do to change it. So as most of you know, a autism spectrum disorders are defined at this point purely by behavior. There's no biological marker that will let us do a blood test or measure something and say that a child or an adult has autism. Um, to make things even more complicated, um, ASDs are defined by difficulties in three areas, social reciprocity, communication delay or deviance, and restricted and repetitive behaviors. Um, and what we've been trying to do in the last few years is figure out what are these areas, what makes them so obvious in some ways and yet so subtle in others. Now, ASD, at least some aspects of ASD, really fall on a continuum. So in order to study ASD, we have to force these continua into um, categories. Um, but really, we know that the behaviorals vary. The behaviors vary. And this is just from a standardized diagnostic instrument where these are scores, so from low to high, high meaning more abnormal, and this is the cumulative proportion of subjects. These are all children who are very young, nonverbal, and equivalent in nonverbal skills. And these are typical children. It just shows you the range. This is 100%. So up to from 20% to 100% of kids with typical kids have scores. The very highest scores were up to four. Whereas if we look at kids with diagnoses of PDD, NOS, or milder autism, we have much more variability overlapping a little bit with the typical kids. Um, and then we have kids with autism without intellectual disabilities and kids with autism with intellectual disabilities. What I want you to see here is we can easily separate this group from these groups, but there is overlap. And if we need categories, we have to, to some degree, force the categories and say, OK, if you fall in here, you have ASD. If you fall over here, you don't have ASD. And then here are these kids that fall in the middle. Now, I'm going to try to make this a little bit more real with videotapes in a minute. But we can make reliable diagnoses of ASD down to age two and maybe even younger and all the way up through adulthood. And we can quantify the severity of ASD. That is, we can measure how severe or how impacted is a child's life by the behaviors associated with ASD. The trouble is that really a prototype model, which is sort of like if you think about prototypes of birds as sparrows and robins, it probably fits autism more than a linear model. That is, we know a lot about kids in here who have the most clearly defined behaviors. Um, and we can measure how different they are from kids out here who have less clearly defined behaviors. And I can teach you to draw this line right here if I want to, but this line isn't a real line between autism and PDD. I've just kind of made it up because we have to figure out how to quantify it. So we can decide who has the spectrum, and we can decide how severe it is, but actually determining um, what are the lines that are associated with biology are not well decided. In addition, to make this harder, ASDs are developmental disorders. That is, they change with development. A child at two who has autism does not look the same as that same child will look when they're 10 or 20 or 30 years old. Um, a child who is four with autism, who is functioning at a two-year-old level, looks different than a child who is four with autism, who is not intellectually disabled, who's functioning at his age level. So we always have to take development into account. 
In addition, autism affects development, and I'll show you a little bit in a minute how that might be, but for a child with autism who doesn't, for example, ever have a friend, they don't get the feedback that friends give you. So the autism not only affects where you start, but it affects where you go. Now I think this area is one of the greatest areas of hope for treatment, because if we can change the experiences of children with autism and not let them be limited by their own disorder, we may be able to really change the trajectory. Now, in addition to that, autism is defined both by positive or abnormal behaviors, the things that you see immediately, like a child who is looking at their fingers or smelling things or lining things up or talking furiously about buffaloes, um, but it's also probably more importantly defined by the absence or diminution of normal social behaviors. But that makes the diagnosis much more complicated because we then have to know what is a normal behavior in that context. And many of us have preconceptions about what normal behaviors are that really aren't true at all. So in coming up with a diagnosis, we have to try to identify situations where typical children do a very restricted number of things so that we can see when a child isn't doing typical things. Um, and I put this slide up just because this is from a summer camp with kids with autism whom you, who are not that different than the kids I'm going to show you in a minute who are very little. But if you look at the very little ones, you'd think I would never imagine them eating pizza in the rain in a summer camp. Um, what I'm going to do now is show you just a few video clips from a standardized observation where we're trying to figure out how to diagnose autism in, two, in toddlers. And what I'm going to show you first is just a short interaction between an examiner and a child who's under two. And the first child in each set is a child that we think, or actually we know because we've now followed them, has autism. The second clip is a child who does not have autism, but has a language delay. And what I hope you will see is that actually the differences are quite subtle and are much more obvious when you see the second clip, that is, see the child that doesn't have autism, when you just see the child that does. Let's hope this works. So here the examiner is teasing him and just seeing what happens to this boy if he offer, she offers him a bubble gun and she won't give it to him. Oh. And think about what isn't he doing compared to this little boy who does not have autism. So, in fact, I know the differences are not big, but hopefully there will be a theme here. <laughs> okay, this here, she's blowing up a balloon, letting the balloon fly all over the room, and then she's going to pretend that suddenly she can't get that balloon to blow up. So she's interested in what does the child do to get her to blow the balloon up or cheer her on as she struggles with the balloon. Okay, okay this is a little boy that has autism. Think about what is he doing, but what is he not doing that you would expect a child to do in this context? And this is a little boy with a language delay. Oh, I can't get it. Oh, no. Should I try one more time? Yeah. Okay. Now, what I wanted you to see is both little boys were near her. Both little boys were moving their bodies, but there are differences in how the first little boy and the second little boy move their bodies, and the fact that the, first, the second little boy looks right at her and vocalizes, even though he can't really talk, um, and gestures to her, whereas the second little boy is actually trying to use her to inflate that balloon. So he knows where that balloon goes. Um, so it's not that he doesn't know what's going on, Okay, and then the last one, I'm going to talk over this because this is a little bit long. The examiner is, and the mother who's sitting over in the corner are just going to ignore this little boy. He's been in the room with them for about an hour, is quite settled, and they're just going to ignore him. This is a little boy who has autism, and I want you to see what he does. And again, the point is this is, this is pretty subtle. We're looking more for the absence of behaviors than the presence of abnormal behaviors. Now, 
in this setting, the average length of time when we ignore a child for them to try to get our attention is 15 seconds. Okay. Um, and we will go for a minute, which seems like a year. But my point is, think about in this child's life, if for every minute or every five minutes when someone isn't engaging him, if he doesn't engage them, what does that teach him about social development? And how does that affect his ability to get information and learn from people? This is a little boy who is intellectually disabled. Scooch him out maybe like in the middle between us. And see what his reaction is to being ignored. And then you can respond to him. So not autistic. is that, sorry, I don't want to do this again, is that it may seem to you like we are like the fellow with a microscope where we're obsessing over tiny things. Um, but my point is these are important things. If a child is getting radically different amounts of feedback about from people and learning less from people starting at 15 months or 18 months, what does that do about brain function? And also, what, how can this perhaps help us figure out what's going awry? Now, genetic studies um, of ASD began with twin studies. And what's interesting about them are a number of things. First, identical twins, if you have a child with autism who is an identical twin, the chances of the other child having a autism are about 60%, so much higher than fraternal twins, which is probably is under 10% and perhaps under 5%. So suggest there is a genetic component to autism. Um, if you include the broader phenotype, that is, you include language delays, high social anxiety, um, social aloofness, then the concordance or agreement in identical twins for ASD-like symptoms is 90%, so very high. And this was the start of autism genetics. Um, it was then followed up by family studies that suggested that if you have a child with autism, your chances go way up from say one in 150 to maybe one in 20 or even higher um, of having another child with ASD and your chances of having a child with some kind of related problem and that may be a language delay that actually resolves itself are also significantly higher. Now we'll hear more from Dr. Fishback and I'm sure in our conversations about the molecular genetics that's followed up on this. But I think one of the important behavioral things is that when people took all of the twins in the twin study, so there were about 80 twins, and they randomly sorted them, so instead of matching them with their own twin, they matched them with a twin that they weren't related to at all, and then they looked at the pattern of differences in verbal IQ between these randomly generated twin pairs. Um, this is the range of a standard deviation, and this is this, these outside lines are for the twins that weren't related to each other at all. Then you look at what is the relationship in IQ between the kids, the twins that are their own identical twin, and it actually fits right in here with the random distribution. So what does that mean? It means that the genetics of ASD are affecting autism spectrum, but there's still huge variation, even with identical twins, in other factors like verbal IQ. So that you can see, look at this, 50% of the population of twins have a difference in verbal IQ. That's huge. I mean, it's over 60 points. So whatever's being transmitted is not going quite along with verbal IQ. Now we also know that within a population of ASD, we have in incredible heterogeneity or variability in language. And this is just a study we've done where we followed about 200 kids from age two to age nine. And each one of these lines is a different child 
learning language. And you can see this is normal. This would be what normal is. There's everything from kids who are doing extraordinarily well to kids who are coming along much more slowly. So we have the case where we may have a number of different etiologies, we've got to find these brain mechanisms that can then account for all this, all this heterogeneity, these differences in here. And I think what the twins remind us is that even when we presumably have the same etiology, we can still have heterogeneity. We can still have a twin who is highly verbal um, and can talk your ear off, and another twin who also has ASD who is nonverbal. Now, what does this mean about treatment? Um, the most well-established finding in behavioral treatment of autism is that intensive ABA results in improvements. And this is the most well-established finding for randomized control trials. These improvements generally have been measured in IQ and language scores and result in improvements of about 10 or 20 points. So that's great if you are, say, have a verbal IQ. I'm not trying to say verbal IQ is the end of all of anything, but just because it's measured of 70, going from 70 to 90 is incredibly important. If you have a verbal IQ of 30, going from 30 to 40 may make a big difference in your life, but it does not pull you into normality. Um, on the other hand, these are very significant changes. Recently, just in the last five years, there have been a lot of very brief, primarily parent-directed interventions around joint attention. Those have shown smaller changes. They often involve just an hour a week of working with parents, but they have shown consistent changes in language, attention, and IQ um, in randomized control trials. There is also a huge literature looking at very specific kinds of behavioral plans and behavior programs to reduce aggression, to increase um, communication, um, that involve doing very specific things, and those things have shown improvement. So it's not that we don't know anything, but I think we also realize that there are very likely interactions between what the child can do and can't do, and differences between children, and also differences in parents. I mean, somebody just did a study showing that if you're teaching a child by responding to their initiations, and you have a parent who's very responsive, you're change, you don't change anything very much. If you have a parent who's not very responsive, you do. So we need to take into account the rest of the environment. Now, one thing I think we have to remember, though, is autism is very responsive to placebo effects. Now, the good thing is it means that hope and whatever it is that gets to us when we're doing interventions can really make a difference. On the other hand, we have to be very careful. And this is data from a RCT, a randomized control trial of secretin. And you can see these are the kids who got the secretin. These are the placebo. And actually, this is scores and irritability. Everybody went down. Um, and in fact, this was found in numerous sites. And I was part of it and actually was sure something was actually happening. It was so exciting, except that it was happening for our control group just as much as for the treatment group. So what I think I want to propose to you and to get the neuroscientists to think about today is that we need to understand what goes awry and also what goes well, and I haven't talked about that very much um, in ASD, as we plan interventions and as we try to figure it out. And we want to be very careful that we're not you, trying to explain a myth of what people thought autism was 50 years ago that is not really true. In addition, it seems to me that we, one way to think about ASD is that it really should be considered just along the lines of like we would check for hearing impairments or visual impairments. Um, it should be a standard, we should screen for it, but we also know that there are kids who have multiple, or all of us, many of us, have multiple visual impairments. It's not just one thing, it's multiple things, and all of those things need to be addressed and treated, and there's no reason also that that should be stigmatized. Um, I want to end just with a note, and again, an example for you to see um, just the variability in autism, that 
I think things are changing tremendously in terms of changing the trajectories of kids with ASD. By starting early and changing social experience, we can give kids a whole different lease on life. And this is from our social group in Michigan. <clears throat> so this is produced, directed, and written by them. Um, and I think what you can think about here is sometimes I would substitute the word ASD for Waldo. So hopefully this will play. Uh-oh. Welcome to the Where's Waldo channel. Usu we, usually we don't, nobody knows about Waldo's pastimes, but we decided, he's always secretive, but we decided to find him and get an in, intimate look at his personal life. So here to interview, for, for this interview is Waldo himself. Where is he? Where's Waldo? Where'd he go? Not again. So what I wanted you to see is just that it is not that people with autism have no sense of humor or no creativity or no ability to work together because this was film directed and planned by them. And I think the point is we need to come up with models that encompass everything from the little boy that you saw flapping, trying to put the balloon in the researcher's mouth um, to this young man who's in regular school and who sees himself as the next um, Mark Forster or film director. Anyway, on that note, let me thank you very much. Hi, I'm Jerry Fishback, and I'm uh, going to moderate the panel, but um, I'm also going to give about 10 minutes of overview of the biological and biochemical approaches that are currently underway in studying autism. Uh, I am the scientific director of the Simons Foundation Autism Research Initiative, and have been very interested over the past two years in how to approach this complex um, phenomenon through laboratory science. And I must tell you right off the bat, I'm become incredibly optimistic. This is a tough, tough problem. The complexities we just saw clinically are multiplied when one tries to approach this in the laboratory. But it is an exciting time in both neuroscience and in genetics. And I believe that uh, there is as much hope for true insights about autism now than ever in my scientific career of 45 years in the laboratory. So this is a, a valuable and critical effort so Kathy went through the definition of autism as changes in social cognition, changes in verbal communication, and changes in repetitive and restrictive interests. And I quite agree that one must approach these as in their full complexity. I'm not trying to explain all things by certain cellular mechanisms. But it is clear that the autism is manifest through its action in the nervous system and the brain. The human brain is, I believe, one of the most complex objects in the known universe. It's about two and a half pounds, but it does have 100 to 200 billion cells. And the real complexity lies in the connections between those cells in what are called synapses because each cell, each of the 100 billion cells, may make hundreds, if not thousands, of connections with other cells. And that's not even where the complexity lies. The complexity lies in the ability of those connections to change with experience, with environmental input, and with genetic factors. It's the plasticity of the brain that offers its complexity, but also offers great hope for change and recovery and education and therapeutics. This is a nerve cell. It's like any other cell in its outlines. There's a nucleus surrounded by a cytoplasm and a cell membrane that keeps the cell intact. The genetic material is located in the nucleus of that cell. The DNA is packed within the nucleus, and instructions in the DNA enable the manufacture of proteins outside of the nucleus, 
which are distributed to all aspects of the cell. And it's these proteins that are the building blocks of the cell that ensure cell health. And when there is damage to a protein, they lead to disordered function. The nerve cell has a particularly uh, uh, unusual shape. It's polarized. It has a receiving surface and a communicating surface. These genes in the nucleus are what has been offered a great deal of interest and increasing research in recent years. The human genome, and much of this is in recent days, the human genome, the first draft of the sequence, was published in 2001. And it's very clear that differences in our genes are what distinguish you from your neighbor and uh, lead to diversity in physical appearance and mental life. There are a number of ways people have approached the genetics of autism. As Kathy has said, there's no question that this is a genetic disorder. And we must understand the genetics that put people at risk for autism. I believe it's the best way to understand environmental influences is to understand the genes that predispose to autism. They may not cause autism, but they enhance the risk for all sorts of environmental influences. And you've heard about many of them uh, in the lay press and in the literature. I think the best way to understand truly what the environmental risks are is to understand the genetic risk factors. Now, many people think of genetics as having either a, a gene that's functioning or one that is missing, perhaps because the, the alphabet that goes to make up the gene is wrong and the gene's code is misspelled and it no longer makes a protein. But it's now become clear, we really within the last three or four years, that it's not just a yes or no issue. One can have more or less of the expression of a gene. The gene may be present, but it may not be speaking correctly to make proteins. It may be speaking too much. So quantity is important and gene expression is critical. And one approach is to look for structural variations in the genome. And it turns out that ordinarily you inherit one gene from your mother and one from your father. But since 2004, it's become clear that some people have only one copy of a certain gene. Some may have three instead of the normal two. Some may have four or five. So quantity is incredibly important. And I show you this slide simply to show you that the technology is such that it is possible to look through the whole genome in a matter of a few minutes by cutting up pieces of DNA, placing them as little spots, microscopic sized spots, on plates that are called arrays, and comparing one genome, a reference DNA, with DNA from a test subject. Let's say this is from a, a participant in this study who has autism. And as you read along these geno the genome, you can see, just following the blue line, that in some cases, the test genome has a deletion, or it may even have a duplication. And what has become evident since 2007, I'm mentioning these dates to tell you how recent these advances have been, that children with autism have close to 10 times as many structural variations in their genome as do control participants. And the search is on for what is in these segments of deletions and duplications and how do they affect the function of cells? And ultimately, how do they affect the behavior of children with autism? Let me come back to our nerve cell. One thing that's very different about nerve cells is that they form synapses. They communicate with other cells. An impulse, once this cell adds up all of its inputs from sensory information from activity in the brain, 
it send, decides to send a signal in the form of an electric impulse out the, the, uh, the axon, the part of the cell that communicates with other cells. Now, it's almost a truism, but it's a very, it's an instructive way to think of autism as a change in the timing of these impulses. There's something that's not quite right in how these impulses are orchestrated, how they communicate with the next cell in line. And one real possibility is that the defect may very well be at these points of contact or synapses that form between cells. This is a blown up view of one of the synapses. When the impulse arrives right at the end, the um, nerve terminal is signaled to release a chemical onto the next cell in line. It's called a neurotransmitter. And this transmitter either excites the cell or it inhibits it. And it is critical to have the right balance of excitation or inhibition to, in order to perform complex motor acts, sensory percepts, and thoughts and behaviors. There is a gap between the presynaptic, the incoming cell, and the receiving cell. And I want to talk about that. I'm going to give you a little bit of detail to show you how rapidly the genetics has advanced. If I blow up this segment, the gap between the incoming cell and the receiving cell, it may look like this. The, the input releasing transmitter and the postsynaptic membrane receiving that transmitter. And I want to tell you a story at about a black widow spider. And the reason I've included this is that it's my firm belief that advances in autism will really depend on advances in science in many different areas. So when we think of supporting autism, you must always think of supporting research which is not obviously related to autism. It's the whole enterprise which is critical. This story began with an interest in how a venom from the black widow spider can affect the communication between the nerve terminal membrane and the membrane on the receiving cell. And indeed, this spider has a toxin that can be very devastating to the synapse. And within a few years, scientists in Texas, in England, and in other countries isolated this venom and found out what molecules it was affecting at the synapse. This is a drawing of the three-dimensional structure of these molecules. This took about a year after the discovery of the molecules. And they encode a family of proteins called neuro neurexins in the nerve terminal membrane and neuroligins in the postsynaptic cell membrane. These molecules are partners. They bind to each other. And not only do they cause these synapses to adhere, but they seem to instruct the cell whether to make an excitatory or an inhibitory synapse. Now, the interest from our view this morning is that this is an insight into how a synapse communicates. And if one believes, as I do, that autism is a disorder in communication between cells, explaining the behaviors Kathy illustrated, then we really have to learn <coughs> the whole cast of characters in the incoming cell and the postsynaptic cell. None of these were known when I began in science and when I studied synapses throughout most of my career. Most of these molecules shown here in this cartoon have been discovered within the last five to six years. Five to 10 years, I would say. But the striking thing is that careful studies of families of those copy number variants have pointed to several molecules in the postsynaptic and the presynaptic membrane that are altered in children with autism. So one has the hope that we are on the right track, that if we understand more of these uh, alterations genetically, we will have a better handle on how they affect synapses and communication. 
And each one of these discoveries offers the possibility of a new therapeutic target to complement the behavioral therapies that Kathy uh, just described. Now, we won't be done there. I will, I will tell you there's also hope in the genetics. Uh, maybe I'll end with this. To say once a gene is identified, it can be manipulated. This is work of uh, Jay Guy and Adrian Bird in England, where they have identified a gene that leads to a disorder that's similar to autism, not the same as autism. And here they have inserted the gene. Uh, they have, excuse me, they've removed the gene. And without going into detail, it's possible to stop the function of a gene by simply inserting a stop signal in the genome. And when they did that, the mouse they, they studied was obese and lethargic. This is a live movie, and the mouse is just not moving. The striking thing is this stop signal, illustrating the power of modern molecular genetics, this stop signal can be cut out and removed by putting a chemical in the drinking water. So a gene's action can be stopped, in this case, the stop signal. And when they looked at the mouse, this is the same mouse over here as we filmed, as was filmed here. And when that mouse is observed, oops, there. It's thin, it's mobile, and it's extremely promising to me and hopeful that if a gene is discovered, hopeful for two counts, is a way to attack that gene and manipulate it but also it says, even here, looking at a mouse, that, that changes in the nervous system are not permanent. There is hope in this type of experiment, whether it's in flies or worms or mice. It suggests that the plasticity of the brain is real and that individuals can recover from genetic and environmental factors. Now, I think because of the time, I won't continue, but. The next steps, once we discover genes, is to find out where are they working in the brain? Which circuits in the brain are particularly vulnerable? And there's been great progress on that front as well. And uh, but it may, perhaps in the question and answer session, we can discuss that. And then how those circuits alter behavior. So should we come to the table with Paul and Nat and Kathy? I'm going to start by asking questions, and then I think Paul will come and lead a general question and answer session. <laughs> now, the, um, I've used a prototypic nerve cell, but we know that there are many, many, many different kinds of nerve cells in the brain. I know that both you and Paul are interested in how you can study particular nerve cells that might be involved in autism. Yeah, I would say the, the key question that we need to address in animal models is which circuits and cell types are affected in these disorders. And the way that you do that is take genes that have been implicated in humans, make mouse models like the one Jerry showed up there, and then ask in great detail out of the many thousands of cell types that are present in the brains, in the brains of these mice, which ones are seriously impacted by these genetic perturbations. And Paul and I, over the last five years in our laboratories and our colleagues, developed novel methodologies so that we can go inside each one of those cells and tell you exactly which proteins that comp comprise the cell and which ones are altered in any condition. So this is a tremendous advance because it not only gives us the um, fundamental properties of the cell, but also tells us how those cells change in, let's say, a mouse model of autism. This is the one way, this is one way in which you can ask, okay, in exactly what part of the brain, in exactly what cell, and in exactly what circuit are these ab animals abnormal? And because we know every protein made in that cell, uh, you can also ask, if these cells are abnormal, which proteins might we manipulate 
to make them more normal. So um, what we're doing now is trying to use this methodology to characterize the various mouse models of autism uh, and understand the circuitry and the molecular pathology in each of the cell types that are relevant to the disease. Please remember all this so you can ask questions. <laughs> or, uh, uh, because it, it does bear discussion and the only way to really push these things is to ask, uh, is to ask the questions no matter how uh, focused you think they are. It's just tremendously helpful to hear your thoughts. Paul, you've been interested in therapeutics your whole career. The, the, how would you approach, there are no good, I think, really specific medicines independent of behavioral therapy for autism. How, but I know you've been thinking about this in your lab. How would you approach this? Well, the way that uh, none are approaching this uh, on our labs, and by the way, one of the most important people, and this is a young lady in the third row, Miriam Heyman, who I would ask to stand up, but she's very shy, and she would be angry with me if I forced her to do that. But anyway, she, she, over five years, developed this extraordinarily powerful technique uh, so that it's now, as Nat said, possible to look at all of the proteins in any given individual nerve cell type and try to understand in mouse models of autism, and the same concepts can be applied to other uh, neurological and psychiatric disorders, to understand which cell types are involved and which proteins in those cells are involved. The limitations right now are the fact that, well, they're twofold. Right, let me tell you what the concept was. Our, our concept was we would take these mouse models of autism and then uh, find out what's wrong in those models. And that's what we're trying to do. The, the one difficulty there is that it's very hard to get mouse mice to do the very complicated behavioral things you saw Kathy uh, Lord show you. It's impossible, basically. So we have to hope that these genetic changes that go on in the human are, in the initial steps, very similar to the ones that go on in the mouse. And uh, it is faith in that possibility that, that uh, drives this program. Another tool that we have available is uh, the use of various uh, medications uh, that are, have partial ability to treat autism. Uh, perhaps Kathy would like to talk more about that. But uh, some of them are effective with certain aspects of, uh, of autism and others are, are not. But we're hoping using those same drugs that have some, albeit limited, uh, clinical efficacy to study what happens in the, behavior, in the biochemistry of the mouse uh, models. Go ahead, go ahead. Actually, I'll, I'll throw something out there, and then if it just duds, you can move on. <laughs> but wa like watching your little obese mouse who wasn't moving, my first reaction is, if that was a child, we would be trying to figure out, like, why isn't it moving? <laughs> and, and what could we do to get it to move? And why is it obese? And I mean, and, and what are the factors? How did it get there? So that's one question. And then how do we change that behavior, partly because kids with autism are here, and we can't just wait, you know, we, we can't wait for the neuroscience while they're here to figure out what to do. But it, but it also struck me, I mean, as you were saying, you can't, we can't do a baby ADOS with a mouse, and it wouldn't mean anything. But there's still a question, is, is, is the mouse development so fast that you can't look at how you get to a point where you have something that you're trying to account for? Does that make I, sense? Uh, yes, it does. I mean, the, and many people <clears throat> will question the use of uh, mice and flies and worms with, with good reason but, uh, in some cases. But this is a case where a mouse is not a human and you have to accept what the mouse exhibits. So while this is not exhibiting social uh, withdrawal or, or lack of social communication, we know this gene is involved in a human disorder. So the animal was obese and immobile. That points to a certain region of the brain called the hypothalamus, which is known to regulate feeding behavior and weight control. And so, but the hypothalamus has many other functions, including social uh, interaction functions and emotional tone. 
So it points to the hypothalamus, and I think this very important study has attracted the interest of scientists to go back to the hypothalamus, perhaps using, and I think one of the investigators, Nat Huda Zogby, is using your uh, ribosome capture technology to study genes in the hypothalamus, hoping to go from human to mouse and then back to human. So I think the behavior is relevant. I, mean, I think this reversibility of the phenotype of the mouse that Jerry showed you is very important because that's an instance where you've provided the normal function of the protein back in an adult and, and reversed the developmental phenotypes. So that's a stunning example that if you can somehow intervene, uh, it's not a permanent disorder. The second concept that everybody should take away from this is that if we are able to identify the circuits that are involved in autism spectrum disorders, and I think we will be through all of this intensive research, there are ways to treat circuits and improve their function that don't necessarily require that we reverse the initial pathologic event. So we can treat a piece of a circuit to increase its activity or decrease its activity to compensate for the abnormality that's present. Um, this concept is very important because in order to do that, we need to know what targets, what cells, and what circuits we're going to treat. Uh, Paul, do you want to take some questions? Well, I think we're close to time to opening it up for questions from the audience. I think we're hearing that this disorder is really um, a, an area that um, will profit from study in a very wide range of disciplines and models, from um, observation of children right down to molecular genetics in mice, and they all have their contribution to make. Well, I want to open it up, this discussion, to questions from the audience. Could um, you repeat the question, yes, actually? Yes, the Jeff? question was, um, could we comment about vaccines and white noise as they pertain to autism? Um, I know more about vaccines than white noise, <laughs> um, but I think that, that th there is no evidence that vaccines cause autism. Um, we can never say in, that for an individual child that vaccines didn't contribute to autism. And we need to be careful because there, there certainly could be a case or cases where this figured in autism. But the two main reasons why people have become concerned about the contribution of vaccines to autism has been the growing um, prevalence of autism thinking that you know, autism is increasing at the time that we are having different vaccines and babies are getting more vaccines. Um, uh, but I think it's become clear that even when we take the components of vaccines out, which people had proposed were contributing to autism, and when the particular vaccines, I mean, it's shifted, the argument of which vaccines and when has changed numerous times in the last 20 years. When those things change, the, the prevalence of autism is continuing to grow, um, certainly to some degree because of changes in definition and increasing in awareness, and then we don't know. But whatever it is, it does not follow the pattern of vaccines. The second source of concern about vaccines came from work by Andrew Wakefield um, that looked at an association between the MMR vaccine and gastrointestinal disorders and autism. That work has now been repudiated on numerous levels, numerous times. And so it's clear that, that that link is not there. So I think where we are left is it's very hard to prove the null hypothesis, to prove that vaccines never cause autism. And I think, um, but I think what we can say is that vaccines prevent um, disease that can have very serious effects. And that is known. And there is no known link between vaccines and autism. Now, I know many parents remain concerned because there is a phenomenon in autism which involves losing skills or regression that does occur at about the same time that vaccines are given. And this, the phenomenon of regression is very, we don't know what it means, and it's very hard to understand, and it, and it is very heartbreaking for anybody who's ever seen it. And I think that link between time 
and, and vaccinations has, has meant that it's almost impossible to take away the fear that families have. But there, there is no controversy, really, that vaccines have, are, do not account for the majority of cases of autism or even a substantial minority. White noise, I've just probably read you know, things in the media, so, so basically I don't, I don't know. I should probably just stay out of that one. Anybody else want to comment on white noise? I bet they're... Any comments from the rest of the panel? What? Any more comments from the rest of the panel? No? I wonder whether Kathy might have speculated and why, despite many studies that have failed to provide evidence in support of the vaccine hypothesis of autism, why this keeps on and on and on, and the people won't let it die. You can understand why it does. It's a very, it's a very powerful image, you know, if a child at a certain age receives many vaccines in a very short period of time and then apparently, and I think this is quite controversial, apparently regresses, although on close observation many of these re children are exhibiting some signs of the subtle ones Kathy pointed out even before the vaccines. But it's, you know, the public uh, does, is not easily convinced by probabilities. And it, it's very hard. It's, a, it's an issue, I think, in how we communicate uh, about science and in public understanding <coughs> of science. I think, um, the, I think the argument will keep coming back and the concern coming back until we understand more about molecular mechanisms and the genetics of autism. There are people interested in uh, immune responses and immunology. And once we understand that, I think then we'll have a more direct test of the vaccine hypothesis. But I quite agree with Kathy. <clears throat> the, the overwhelming epidemiologic evidence is negative. There's no uh, correlation with vaccines and autism. Good. So we, I hope the microphone's now working. Who has it? Yes, thank you. Um, I'm curious about the treatment, the potential treatment using your obese mouse um, study. It's a two-part question. Is the chemical stop that you would use to reverse the phenotype, is that irreversible and or how long does it last for? Just briefly, I'll be glad to talk to you about it uh, later. The, the experiment I showed was, was artificial in the sense that a critical gene had been identified and the investigator in that study used a molecular trick to turn off the gene as the animal developed. That's not a, that's not a therapeutic, it's, it's an experimental manipulation to turn off the gene. And then, so there was something artificial placed in the chromosome. And then he was able to remove that break on the gene action. So he demonstrated that when he removed the break, the gene could function again and the animal recover. But that's not a direct route to a medicine but it points to the possibility of a medicine. I think it's, Im I think it's important uh, to underline the fact that that kind of experiment, which gave us a fundamental insight into reversing the phenotype of these mice, can't be done in any species of mammal except for mice. So the genetic tools that we have available to investigate these diseases in this small animal are actually critical for us to get gain fundamental insights into the disease. We couldn't do that experiment uh, in a higher mammal. And the gene actually also wasn't a gene for autism. The gene was a gene for Rett's syndrome. So it's, I think the, Jerry's point was this is a model for what we hope to get to um, in terms of of eventual treatment, the idea that this may be able to work, but it's not that there's an autism gene that you can turn off that makes mice that have autism stop being autistic. Yeah. Good. So now I think a questioner just here in the middle. I'll come to the front um, in a moment. Dr. Fishback, you mentioned environmental factors as well, but didn't go any further. So if you have a gene that's not functioning, that's impaired, or the cells aren't prong functioning properly, and then environmental factors such as toxins are, you know, ingested and to small children. Does this have an effect on their their development, and could this autism spectrum 
develop at this time. I've, I've read so many articles on children that have a reduction of toxins and all of a sudden they're seen to have a huge improvement. Um, you just didn't really go any further with the environmental factors. Uh, that's a com complex phenomenon. I think there are many things that can modify the action of genes. And, and that's what we're, I think offers so much hope, that there are genes that increase the risk, and there are modifier genes that might actually decrease the risk. So it's not going to be, I think, what Kathy was getting at, one gene, one disorder. I think there's, we're going to have to deal with a mathematical approach to understanding how these genes interact and what the final cellular result is, what the final circuit result is, and then hopefully what the final behavioral result is as we move up the ladder. So I'm, I don't know of any modifiers yet, but I, I, I think we can't rule those out. Right, could we, in the front, the gentleman in the front, could you wait for the microphone, it's just coming. So uh, one comment was, one of the debates is whether this is a systemic disease or is really limited to the neurologic system. The CNV difference between um, autism children and not, is that limited to a subset of genes or a family of genes or is it genome wide? The it second is. question, which is for, or a comment for Dr. Heinz, is there are some clinical clues as to therapies that at least when you look at large registries of data are more helpful than others. And those might, as you start to identify proteins and families of proteins involved, give you some, some <coughs> greater hints as to therapeutic approaches. So I'll be brief on the first one. Remember the study I cited was 2007. Many people are asking, are these copy number variants recurrent? How common are they? Do they, are we seeing them over the same ones over and over again? The answer is there may be 50 to 100 of them, and they may occur in 1 to 2 percent of the population at risk. But we're just now, and the Simons Foundation is involved in a very large study to see are there hot spots in the genome where there are certain variants which are really much more likely to recur. We don't know that yet. Good. What was the second? Yeah, Any was, more comment? Nat, do you want to comment further? Well, the second part of the question was about therapies, and I think Paul outlined this, but um, because we can look at the molecular events that occur in any cell type in response to, let's say, a genetic perturbation, we can look also at these events in response to any therapy. So any therapy that is either that is relevant and important for aut treating autism that's developed, we can assess in mice and try to figure out what circuits it's actually impacting. This is critical if we're going to develop new therapies. I think there was a question in the front, yes. Uh, what is the relationship between um, a, uh, what is the relationship between the gastrointernal problems in autistic children as well as behavioral problems in autistic children and the toxicity of what they eat, un like unprocessed foods, processed foods, excuse me? We don't know, I think. I mean, you know, there's, okay. I mean there's, there's, there's certainly reason to believe that if you have gastrointestinal problems, that is going to affect your behavior. So I think, I think we need to remember that anybody who is uncomfortable or in pain is going to act differently. And I don't think we should negate that. I mean, I'll say quickly, I have a, I, I have a, there's a 20-year-old young man that I've known forever who is here in New York who I just saw. And his father told me last weekend, he said to the boy or young man, said to his dad, dad, my heart's on flame. And he pulled his shirt up and said, can you blow on my heart and make the flame go down? And then he said, it's, you know, his name, or say, Johnny, Johnny has sad heart. Johnny wants a happy heart. Um, and I think, I think he probably had heartburn. Is, I mean, I don't, I don't know, and I don't think anyone knows. But I think he was trying to say that he had some kind of indigestion. Um, but, I'll, but, you know, he can't talk about that. And so I think that does contribute to, this is a boy who can be very aggressive when he's unhappy. And, and we've been trying to figure out why has he been so 
aggressive recently. So I think that link, just, you know, just the same link that it would have for anybody, is something we can't discount. In addition, you know, I think that there have been hypotheses about more complex links um, between GI function and brain function, which so far have not stood up on any end as far as I, I can tell. <coughs> that, I'll turn that over to Jim. Yeah, I, want, I want to be, um, emphasize a point that the, the brain is not sitting up here in isolation from the rest of the body. Indeed, we have nerves throughout every organ in the body, especially the bowel, and, we re and the brain receives inputs in a very real sense. Our sense of self is, is, is in large part determined by impulses that arrive from different organs in the body. Do you, are you feeling pain? Are you, uh, is, is your stomach upset? All these things offer a certain continuity to the self. So I, am, I especially am interested in what are called these autonomic, un, almost unconscious inputs from the body to the brain. And there's a great deal of interest now in neuroscience to understand how these inputs eventually influence behavior and conscious behavior, where the union is between these unconscious, interoffective, some people call them inputs, and conscious behavior. And I think it's a very understudied phenomenon. There certainly are genes in common between the bowel and the brain, and many children uh, come to the doctors. <laughs> this was always my nightmare for <laughs> <laughs> that I would be called while I was saying something brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> there are genes you in common. <laughs> between the brain and the bowel, and, uh, and, you, and we, so we have to be aware of that all the time. But I agree with Kathy that there's no obvious clinical connection yet. And how it gets back to unprocessed food, we don't know. But I think we probably all wonder. <laughs> Paul? Uh, one important aspect of autism and autistic research that uh, we've not really emphasized today and we should have has to do with the heterogeneity of the disease. It was implied in the slides that Kathy showed on autism spectrum disorder. But it's actually a whole bunch of different diseases. And this is somewhat slow down uh, progress. In fact, this uh, program that uh, Jerry talked about that the Simons Foundation is carrying out uh, involves looking at these different subclasses of autism and trying to get the genetic basis for each of these as separate disease entities. And once that information is generated and from what he's uh, told me yesterday, this will be in the next year or two, we'll have a pretty complete story of the genetic basis for each of these uh, subclasses of autism. It'll be then a lot more rapid progress being made in the laboratory and trying to understand the molecular consequences of these genetic mutations in the individual types of autism. An article appeared, just one addition, in the New England Journal of Medicine last year uh, saying that children with autism seem to improve uh, when they have a fever. And this is another example. Uh, and Marilyn and Jim have told me repeatedly from, from personal experience that th this seems to be the case. And again, it's an example of these unconscious functions of the hypothalamus and fever. And we must learn what those connections are. In the middle, yeah. Hi. Um, I think the reason why the vaccine issue will keep coming up, and many of the questions you're receiving will keep hounding the scientific community is because all parents of children anywhere on this spectrum want to be partners in resolving this issue while we wait for science to catch up to the need. And so my question is for Dr. Lord, as a parent walks in with a very young child and is first thrown into this world of a child they can't relate to or control or soothe, what do you, what, how do you impart, if any, wisdom to the parent to comfort them so that they can be a partner at home? Is there a general dietary suggestion to, to vary the diet, to limit certain foods, or to soothing music? Are there any general therapeutic recommendations that you make to a very lost parent? Um, 
I think that our, our focus is very much on behavior. I mean, trying to see what it is that the child can do, because kids can, you know, all kids can do some things. Um, trying to see what our kids interested in, um, and then trying to see what is holding them back, and then trying to piece together those aspects of behavior so that the world makes more sense to the child, so that the child can communicate the things that they're thinking, but then also to pull that child into our world as much as we can um, in a pleasant way. Um, I think we also want parents to be parents, and I think what's, what's hard is that I think parents of children with autism are immediately tossed into a world where they have to be protectors, advocates, business managers, um, uh, you know, s scientific, um, you know, uh, wardens in some ways, and and I think trying to be able to say, all right, what does this, what can we do with your child now, and where is this going? Not in 20 years, but for tomorrow, what do we want your child to be able to learn? And then let's look at the good things your child can do and take those strengths um, and try to use those to build up the things that are hard. Also not forget the strengths, because in the end, those strengths are going to make it as much of a difference as the hard things. So I think we don't put people on diets. I mean, many families that we see do have kids on diets. And I think certainly being sensible about what your child eats is true for any parent. Um, but I think that we don't think there's a single key. There's just you know taking it one step at a time. That's hard, though, because it's a pretty overwhelming experience, and many of you can testify about that far, far more than I can. But I think also remembering their kids, you know, and their kid, you know, there are all kinds of things about being kids: things you like, things you don't like, things you can't do, things you won't do, and how do we work around that and not forget? Ultimately, this is a person, you know, they're here, yep. um, and and in a family, and not let that get you know, tossed by the wayside. Now, I think we still have a couple more questions over here at the very, well, there's two there, so one there and then one at the back. We have one. Quick question. Why are, do we see this more often in boys than girls? If, if we could answer that question, <laughs> you, you want to answer it's it? A, it's a key <laughs> question, and uh, you know, the, what many people would say right away, is that it has something to do with the X chromosome, but the best data to date are that that's not true. So again, it's these modifying factors. There's something about uh, the women and the dimorphism, and women are not identical with men. Something about the dimorphism in the body and the brain that might be protective is one hypothesis. Hi, thank you. Um, as the mother of an 11-year-old Asperger's son, I'm curious, um, Dr. Lord, you were talking, um, you had a young man at the, um, on your video, and you, um, you had a social group or something. I found in my experience that um, I have tried every traditional um, psychotherapy, uh, CBT, sort of to enhance his social ability, and it, I, I, I was struck by, um, my suspicion is that your group was for observation purposes, or have you, uh, or have you found benefit through um, a social skills group and things like that? We have found some benefit with medication. Um, um, we we run groups that affect, I mean, we call social groups. They're, I think that p partly we feel they work, but partly our expectations are quite different than a social skills group. I mean, these groups run forever. I mean, the kids now, I mean, they're now a hierarchy, so we have eight of them in Michigan. And like the teens all want to move into the older teens group and the older teens into the adults. People do move out of them. I mean, if they get a social life that is, that, you know, they have something better to do. But I think what we, our first line of, our first goal is shared enjoyment. We want it to be positive. We want the kids to interact with each other. We also include typical peers. <coughs> Um, and then the idea is not to teach a skill, but for each um, participant in the group, these are, these are clinical groups, we have goals for that child. So this, this, the boy that you saw 
the, is very interested in interacting. He has all kinds of approaches. The problem is not that he doesn't want to be around people. It's that he doesn't know quite what to do. And he's the kind of kid who go right up to the nose of the person that he likes and talk in their face. And so a goal is let's back off, I mean, for him. Um, and another child, the goal may be getting them into the group. So we have very pragmatic goals. We just readdress those goals about every three months with the parents and other teachers. Um, and then in the groups, which meet for about an hour and a half once a week, we try to create positive activities that really pull the kids into social interaction. I think our hypothesis <laughs> is that many, almost all kids with autism and adults don't have enough opportunities to interact with other people because other people don't stay with them um, long enough. But if you do stay with them, people like them and they like other people. So we're trying to create that. And, and you know, my fantasy is that this, you know, this will move on. I mean, we did have, for example, a group, three men in the adult group just rented an apartment next door to our clinic, much to our surprise. <laughs> um, but they did it, you know, on their own. So that's where we're trying to go. And we have some data where we followed this, where what we show is changes not so much in high-level skills immediately, but long-term changes in the positive attitude toward people, assumption that someone will like you if you tolerate them, decreases in inappropriate behavior, and then just changes, for example, in proximity. When you walk into a room in the group, how long does it take you to get be interacting with someone else? That kind of thing. So we're not claiming we're curing anything, but it does feel like relationships are really developing, and, and that's what we want to do. We feel like if we can set the stage for that to happen and then provide guidance um, sort of in the background, then, then good things will happen that, that again are just one drop in the bucket. So there are many other approaches that need to go on at the same time. I'm afraid I'm going to have to stop the um, questions there because we're overrunning. Thank you very much to our speakers. Thank you for our panelists. Thank you. Thank you.